There she blows. Got the plane auxiliary storage. Welcome back. The latest updates on my Kit Fox build. So the plane's been moved over to what I call auxiliary storage for the time being. I actually have a storage unit for it. I'll put it down there eventually, but for now, it just got wheeled over here to get it out of the way to leave room for me to work on the wings. Some things that I've gotten done on the actual fuselage in the meantime, not a whole lot. I did end up sanding these door frames down, um, got them smooth. There's a little bit of work that still needs to be done on this right side. But what I've been doing is using really, really high grit sandpaper, like uh, 80, even 30 grit, because um, it makes the sanding process go a lot faster. And you're not really going to see, if you use 80 grit, you're not going to see those grooves through the fabric. That was a recommendation from Peter. Thank you, Peter. Sorry, it's kind of dark in here, but my rod ends finally came in and I got my elevator actually hooked up. Um, it does have an issue. So this push-pull tube, as you can see when it comes back, it makes contact with the top of the seatbelt. And the way I'm going to fix that is instead of lengthening out these two rod ends by loosening them, if this isn't making sense, this whole flight control system is controlled basically by these rods with little rod ends on the end. There are 19 of them. Those rod ends can be tightened and loosened on threads so that they can be extended and contracted. The manual says to extend this one. It says to bring it out half an inch. If you do that, it makes you contact the seatbelt tab. So what I'm going to do is shorten that one and extend the second rod end. So I'm going to do that right now. Let's see if it actually works. And bam, just like that, problem solved. Just reiterate what was wrong here. The front push-pull tube for the elevator, the manual tells you to extend this half an inch on each end. If you do that, it'll contact the seatbelt center mount tab when it comes to the full backswing. So instead of extending this front one half an inch, either extend the middle one or the rear one half an inch, and you will not run into this issue. I maintained my rig angles by measuring the amount of turns on each end of these rod ends and matching it with that one. So there was 10 turns on the front and 10 turns on the rear. So I did 10 turns on this one, 10 turns on that one. So it's still the exact same rigging that I already set up, but it doesn't, doesn't rub. There's my elevators, rigged and all. I actually got the trim set up as well, but it's not hooked up to a battery. So this had to be rigged according to the manual. Really a pretty easy thing to do, but you need an angle measuring tool. What I did, to do this was you clamp this in this position right here so that it's level. And then you set this to, I think it's 33 millimeters from the top of the bar. So you trim this to the right height. You just like, clamp it between two wood blocks so it's correct. And then you just lengthen those rod ends on the front and lengthen the ones in the back to get it to be just the right length of push-pull rod to get that angle. Actually, I should say, before I did that, I actually taped the control stick in an 80 degree forward position. So you tape it forward and backwards so it can't wiggle. So all these things are, the elevator's locked in place, the control stick is taped in place, and then you match it to this angle so it's set just right. And uh, I'll have to do the same thing for the flaperons when I get there, but they haven't been finished or installed yet. Something I wish I would have done from the start, and something I wish I would have known from the start, is when you're doing high saw, if you wrap masking tape around the sides of where you're high sawing, and then on the back, you high saw it in place, and then before the high saw dries, you take the masking tape off, you won't have to come back and clean all this stuff up. I wish I did that um, from the start. It would have would have been a lot easier. <laughs> I would have saved a lot of sanding and finish work and then paint and all that stuff. There you go, if you're doing it. Pro tip, there's the actual trim arm in its full extended position this this goes up and down and this whole horizontal stabilizer actually flies up and down to trim and you have to set that to the upper height and then adjust the rod end at the top here to get it to be in the right trim position so in order to get that running you need a 12 volt battery so I, I wired up the cables and actually got the switch running and then hooked the switch up in the front to a 12 volt battery and then got this set up to the right height you have to do that in order to rig it. The trim, the trim motor is actually pretty quick. 
I've read on the forum that some guys put like a, an attenuator on it so that it doesn't run so quickly because it's kind of hard to get it in the exact position. And with trim, you know, you might have to be pretty delicate with it. So that's something I'm going to be looking into because I was noticing as I was setting it up to try and get it to exactly 33 millimeter spacing up here, I had to sort of push it up a little bit and then push it too far and push it back to get it to be just right. Took a little bit of uh, finagling to get it right, but it's, it's in there. It's not connected fully. Actually, none of these, none of these are because this is going to come off and get covered. You can see on the end, I've done the finish work on the ends. Super smooth, but still it was done with 80 grit. You can see grooves, but you won't be able to see it through the fabric. And I was actually able to get through some of this high saw, which is harder than the body filler with a file to get it close to shape, then hit it with the 80 grit, and then did one pass with 120 just to get some of the big burrs off. Another thing here at the back of the plane that I actually asked the factory about, um, I, I went and asked, I called factory and asked John, what should you do before you cover? What, what things need to be done before you cover? And he brought up this. And I actually had the machinist fabricate this. This is way too perfect for me to do myself. It's a piece of aluminum. But what this is for is, and it's an aluminum plate for a DME, well, it's not a DME antenna, it's an ADSB antenna that's gonna mount way back here in the back. The reason why they do that, it normally mounts in the tray up in the front, but that actually interferes with the communication system and makes it click, so you can hear the clicking, which is annoying. I, I'm familiar with that. There, a lot of planes have that issue. So what John said they've been doing is fabricating a little aluminum plate that they mount to the back here, and you can mount the DME antenna way out of the way of everything so it doesn't interfere. I keep saying DME antenna, it's an ADS-B antenna, which is also a DME antenna at the same time. Uh, a thought about this. So it, it, it sits on the stringer and the longeron, I guess what it is, this outside tab. It's got a slight taper to it. I actually did four and a half inches in the front and four inches, I believe, believe even in the back. And this is four and three eighths inch long. It's longer than it needs to be, but it's about, about right. I'll put the drawings. I actually made some 3D drawings. I'll put them up on the website. And then this is half inch tubing, so it's a half inch deep. Mine I'm actually gonna have to shim up because the brake that we're using to bend it was too long. But it's still gonna be better than what I would have done. So Peter, again, thank you Peter, brought up something that I saw in the picture. So John just sent me a picture of this from the factory, so I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I just sort of extrapolated from the picture dimensions and sizing and things like that. And I saw in the picture there were only rivets on the stringer. So this is the stringer this little aluminum tube that comes down the middle of the plane. It's just safety wired on. This is by no means a structural member of the aircraft. It's just to hold the fabric off the frame so it's got a nice clean line. The rivets only go in the stringer because this is a structural tube. So if you look at the picture from the factory, they have rivets on the inside piece and none on the outside piece. It's just glued on, which I was a little concerned about because I was worried this would wobble. So you just, instead you just high saw this and rivet and high saw this and that'll hold it in place because you do not want to drill holes in structural tubing which this is especially it's got a lot of force from the tail wheel um, and I almost made that mistake I would have had I not been corrected so thank you again Peter um, but this is this is something I gotta get mounted before before I do fabric so not in the manual no instructions but I will give you my drawings so that you all can make this plate they will be apparently offering it with the prefab panel option, but who knows when that's going to be available. So you're on your own for now, as usual. I thought about a design for the rudder pedals that would make them less aggravating. Not that really anybody cares, but if somebody's an expert builder and they wanted to try this, maybe, maybe it'd be worth a shot. What you could do is weld <clears throat> using a straight tube straight across the center of the fuselage you could use that as a fixture to weld some permanent rudder mount tubes into the fuselage. And that would ensure that this thing would be mounted perfectly straight across and you wouldn't get the crooked binding that uh, is so common with these things. One of the issues with the rudder pedals is every single one of these mounts has to be perfectly in the right plane. So if one of them's off, then you're gonna bind on that one, or actually I'll bind on both of them. Or if it's tilted this way, there's basically five directions that it could be off, five degrees of freedom, and that's on three different points. So a single, a single plane would solve the problem, and the way to get that would be with a, 
with a fixture to permanently mount these in. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's tried that. It would be the same solution for the control column. And, and another option would be actually to make a single bracket that all these mount to. That's a single sheet of aluminum that goes all the way across. And that way you can ensure these are all in plane with each other from the, from the factory. Because uh, the way this design works is just kind of loosey-goosey. And I hope somebody smarter than I am and more capable at fabricating could, could do that and maybe give it a try. My actual transponder antenna did come in. There it is. It's a tiny little plastic fin that actually mounts on the bottom of the plane because the signal is going to be sending down to stations on the ground and also to other airplanes around you. But the big one is the ADSB in stations on the ground. And that actually mounts to this plate, which was in the back of the plane. Let's see, it's got the tabs on the side. This is going to mount right on the bottom of that. And it'll sit way in the back, away from anything else so it doesn't interfere. Got this in, not because I need it now, but I wanted to make sure that it fit before I glued it into the plane and basically permanently mounted it back there. Permanently mounted this back there so I knew that this would fit. That DME antenna was a RAMI. Sorry, it's transponder DME or ADS-B. It's RAMI blade type 0 0.0425 long mounting studs. It's got a TSO, so it's fully certified and everything. You don't necessarily need all that, but this is what I bought. It was, man, it was pretty expensive. It's like probably 200 bucks or something like that. And then this one is an actual comm antenna. I don't know anything about comm antennas, so I just bought this from Aircraft Spruce. I bought all this stuff from Aircraft Spruce, but I do need to mount this not mount it, but get it mocked up and drilled before covering. Last little goodie that came in the mail. I actually have never really seen one of these in person. This is the experimental GMU-11. It's a magnetometer. What this does is it acts as your compass instead of having a compass card. This feeds information to the G3X. It's pretty small. It's super light. I mean, it weighs maybe 20, 30 grams. I don't know. idea. I could look up the spec. This actually mounts in the wingtip, so you don't need it, but I wanted to see it before I did cover just so I could be sure that it would be all right. So I talked to the factory, they say they mount it in the wingtip and they actually run the wiring down the rear spar. This has to be away from pretty much all electrical and all ferrous metals, so anything that's magnetic. So you cannot put it in the, in the frame inside the fuselage because there's magnetic interference from the chromoly. This is all aluminum, so there's not really any interference out here. There is a wingtip light which could interfere. I thought I could build a tray and mount it kind of in the back somewhere, I don't know, somewhere inside here so that it uh, doesn't interfere with the wingtip light. But if that's what the factory does, then if the factory mounts it on the wingtip, then it's probably fine. It's, it's kind of crazy that I'm thinking about electronics already. It's been a little over a month and I actually have to start thinking about that stuff because once the covering goes on, it'll be not impossible, but nearly impossible to run these cables and you have to crawl back there. I'm not small, I'm not a big person, but I'm not that small. So it'd be hard for me to get back there and I just don't wanna to have to deal with that. So a lot of the things in, they're in this checklist in the front that they mentioned when I was leaving the factory, but that checklist is really important. In fact, I'd follow it before I follow the manual. I just actually follow the steps in the checklist instead of following the order of the manual because that's what the factory uses before they cover. So they go through that entire checklist and make sure that all those things are done before they put covering on. And some of the things that are on there are running some of the wiring. Um, and let's show, show you another thing that I did, also on the checklist, the priming of the spars. They're actually both primed, the front and the rear spar with epoxy primer. I put three coats on each one. I did brush it on, which is not what you're supposed to do. This is a spray product, you get a better seal. But I figured, you know, it, it's like an enamel coating. It's super thick on there. Oh, maybe I should, before I do that, I'll show you how my little, my little rotisserie works. So here's my screw that I actually welded on there. So it's a uh, bolt that I welded a little piece of metal rod and then another nut. So I drilled a hole in the piping, welded that nut on, and then now this thing drills all the way through and it'll hold this from turning. That's on both sides. This is how the rotisserie works. You get both sides loose and then just gently turn the whole thing over. 
super convenient. You almost can't function without it. It's, it's a must. You gotta build a rotisserie. A lot of guys do it out of wood. You don't have to make them out of metal, but having that locking function and the ability to hold it in place is critical. So I had a, an issue solved. I was worried about rib stitching this number three rib because I already showed this. There's no gap to get a stitching needle on because I had to space this over all the way to get that threaded piece. Actually, it's way in the back there, that threaded piece in that elbow. So instead, what I'm going to do, which is, I don't know why I didn't think about this, but I'll just stitch these top caps individually on the top and then on the bottom. Same thing with the number two rib, which you couldn't, you couldn't even stitch anyway all the way through because there's a tank there. So I'm not going to cut slots in my tank. I'm just going to stitch through the top. So I can definitely get a needle around there and it'll be enough to stitch this down to feel comfortable about it. That problem has been solved. Another problem that I solved, the tow transport kit. This is the actual lockback brace I was looking for. So this is the one that what I was confused about. This is for the forward mount. This is some, a telescoping pole that opens up that bolts first to the front. Ooh, it's gonna fall apart. It bolts to the front of the plane using the existing hardware. Then this actually goes to that little fish mouth at the bottom and that'll support the front end of the spar from flexing. I did get the instructions for these. There is like a part list for this that's helpful. It shows you how to put these together and what hardware to use. Also, if you get the color copy of the manual, you can actually see what's going on in there and then you can see this piece which was white and on a white spar so you couldn't see it in the black and white version of the manual. But the color version, it's still really hard to see. You can get a better idea. That's a kind of a complaint of mine. <clears throat> I wish there was a digital copy of the manual that had color images because the black and white photos are just really hard to look at sometimes. But I did, did figure this out and I'm glad I have the tow transport kit. Uh, another little piece of advice, don't fold your wings until you have flapperons because this will swing back too far if it doesn't have flapperons and it'll contact the spar. At least that's what it did for mine. So it may not do that to yours because their spar notches might be different. So I, if, I, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't have folded my wings other than to check clearance for my number one rib. Um, it, I wouldn't have folded it. So, because you're, you're putting stress on the spar and on the carry through spar in the fuselage that is unnecessary and it's not gonna cause huge damage, but it did scratch my paint, which I'm a little upset about. I obviously painted that over, but it is just something I, I wish I didn't do from the start. Here's a cool side project I work on. This is a, the wing, this is a wing rack. So when I'm not working on one ring, wing, I put it in the, in the rack so that it doesn't tip. And it's actually sitting on a piece of webbing. I <laughs> stole this idea from Project Kit Fox again. Great YouTube channel. What I didn't, I didn't get to mention is there anything, I just saw it in the back of his video, but I took a full length stud. So that's, how long is a stud? Eight feet, 12 feet, whatever it is. Full length stud. And then this is a three foot piece of stud. There are three three foots and space this 10 inches. There's also another three foot base at the bottom. And I took an old set of ratchet straps that I cut down to make this webbing. I actually still have the ratchet straps. There was plenty left on it. So I have little mini ratchet straps now. And then drew, uh, drilled these in the top with washers so that they're held in place. And it is a great place to store the wings. They're safe. This thing's solid, it's not gonna tip over. And I'll be able to actually store these at a slight angle, so one of them's higher than the other, so that these won't collect water. The rudder is done, almost. The top's been shaped super smooth, again, used 80 grit. And then I actually did sand all the way down to the bare chromoly, so I went back and primed that surface so that I didn't have any bare metal. Did that on all the actual points where the ribs make contact with the frame so that it was a nice smooth transition. And I actually have to come back and sand a little bit of paint drips that formed. This has all been shaped. And then I mounted the taillight housing. This is an option, pretty cool. You can put an LED in there. You can actually, in theory, put an ADSB, one of the UAVionics ADSB units in, which would solve all of my antenna mounting issues, but I'm not gonna do that. I decided to glue this on before I cover. I had a debate about this. It's probably six to one and a half dozen the other. It went on pretty well with high saw. 
it's really sturdy and it'll be wrapped with fabric. So you'll have maybe a cleaner line. I'm not sure how it's gonna look. It's definitely gonna have to be reinforced with the fabric. There's not much guidance in the manual on that. So I'll have to make some phone calls to make that work. But this rudder, all I need to do is run the actual wire and drill a hole in there and she'll be ready to cover. So that's pretty exciting. If you wanna see a failed attempt at a wing rotisserie, this is one of them. <laughs> the hole saw that I used, which was I don't know, two and three quarters or whatever it is, is off by a 16th of an inch. And if you go down a hole saw size, it's too small. So you either have to drill the hole too small and then sand it up or drill it too big and basically glue it in. I'm abandoning this project. In order for me to get to this to work, I'd have to high saw all these in and then drill them in place. So what I've done is I just bought PVC elbows and I'm not gonna be cheap about it and try and make it out of studs. So maybe you have a better idea of making this work, but I'm just gonna admit my failure at making a really, really horrible wing rotisserie. What I am gonna do for the wing rotisserie is size it down to inch and a half. So I'll use a coupler on, a, on an appropriate one, not this size, but I'll size it down to inch and a half tubing on one side because the doublers make it so that the PVC won't fit on the end. So you kind of have to cut huge slots in the PVC and it makes it, these are little slots. The slots for the doublers are like that big. So you have very little PVC left and it's hard to get them in and out and it's kind of sketchy. So you got wings sitting on a sketchy platform. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna size it down to a smaller so it fits in there for sure. I'm gonna make it really long, like 12 inches long, a foot long, so that it goes way into the spar and the only way for it to come out would be for it to pull out 12 inches, which is, it's unlikely to happen. And I'll, it'll just be a much safer way of having the wings in the rotisserie. Sure, they'll have slop, but it'll be actually safer, even though it's not really snug and tight, it'll be safer than having the sloppy two inch pipe that's been cut down and butchered so that it fits. So finally, I've gotten these flap rods out and started work on it, working on them. I glued and riveted these end caps in which cover the end and then there's foam ends just like the elevator and rudder those little foam ends that i have to shape down so that it's a nice contour and then i drilled these little tiny number 40 holes that are going to take a flush i'm going to take a flush uh, solid rivet which you need a rivet squeezer for and i didn't have one so i had to order it it was 130 bucks another one of those tools putting on the list um, so they'll have nice flush rivets on the back which will look a lot nicer and it'll be slightly more aerodynamic. Now you could use pop rivets, but then you're gonna have little pop rivet nubs on the back of your flap rods and not a huge deal, but also not that pretty. These are the flap rod counterweights. They go on the front of the flap rods actually pointing down and balance the weight of the flap rod in front of the pivot point, which is right here. So this mass is the same as the mass behind the pivot, the fulcrum. All you have to do is drill them. There's 11 holes to put in. There's four on the front, four on the bottom, and three on the top. They only drilled three, three of the 11 holes. And I don't know why they chose these three. These are probably the easiest ones to drill. Maybe that's why they drilled them. But then you have to drill the rest, the remaining eight holes. And you just basically mark them on the flapper on in the right position. And then once the holes are drilled, you drill it in and then high saw and rivet it in place. Standard procedure. Here's the actual end that's been shaped. Just put some foam ends in, put the high saw in, and I gotta put body filler on there and come back and smooth it out. I gotta admit something that I'm not very proud of. I actually lost a lot of sleep over. Um, when I was working on these, I had them on the table on top of the packing pads because it says not to rest them on the table, but I didn't have them wrapped up. I have them wrapped now so they can't slip off. This one, while I was working on the front end, slipped off the side of the table and I did slightly bend the back corner of the flapper on. I came back and bent it back. You can't really see it. You can kind of see where my pliers grabbed it a little bit. I'm gonna put body filler on there and smooth it out so you won't see it. And if I didn't tell anybody, nobody would have ever noticed, but you do make mistakes building this kit. So I just thought I'd admit that it's, I'm probably gonna lose sleep again, about it again tonight. It's not something I'm proud of, um, but all those blemishes if you do take the time, you can come through and, and sand them down and get them smoothed out so that when paint and fabric goes on, you won't ever see them. The only person who will know will be me, which I'll look out the wing and I'll see that tiny little bend on the end of the flapper on and I'll know 
that was my mistake. Fortunately, I'm learning and I don't know if I'm ever gonna build one of these again because it's a lot of work. But if I do build one again, I'll know all these tricks. And maybe if you're building one of these, hopefully you can learn from these little mistakes that I made the first time around so that you don't make them when you get to it. I've certainly learned from other people's mistakes who've put videos up on YouTube. Again, Project Kit Fox is a great channel for this stuff. Anyway, I hope, hope that you know these little mistakes help other people learn and other people understand the effort and patience that it takes to build a plane. Okay, I've been building this for a little over a month and I'm basically through the entire manual before fabric. So I feel like I'm maybe qualified to talk about the kit as a whole. I enjoy the process. It's, it's been a really fun experience and um, I've learned things, not only technical skills, but also uh, patient, things about patience and um, sort of discipline, just sort of greater life skills in building this kit. There are some, there are definitely some issues with the kit. I'm not gonna say that it's all sunshine and rainbows, but they're fixable issues. I wanna try and say this delicately so I don't step on any toes. This kit is not perfect. It's uh, what I would call a work in progress. In fact, I was on the phone with John and John McBean at the factory and he said, I was talking to him about some issues that I had in the manual and he said the manual is a work in progress. He said they started building factory aircraft in 2009. So before that, it was just a kit. So since then, they've been trying to improve the manual and make it easier for other builders to get there. It has been 11 years. I feel like 11 years is a pretty long time, but there's still quite a few issues that you run into in fabricating this process. Most of the traditional clients, I'd say for kit planes, are generally retirees who are happy to spend lots of time getting pieces to be just right and fabricating them down, sanding them. And it gives a lot of people joy to put that much effort into basically fabrication to make a beautiful part. Well, I grew up in a CNC era where pieces are milled to a computer design spec or they're turned or whatever it is, they're fabricated to a perfect specification in a computer run machine so that they fit perfectly right out of the box. If you look at Mike Patey's build, he's building um, a plane called Scrappy. I'll put a link to that. He designs all of his parts so they fit. In fact, he brought up a point that kind of frustrates me. He's fabricating with powder coat in mind. In fact, he, he makes spacers slightly longer when he's welding so that he can account for the width of paint in the end. That's the type of thing that Kit Fox could do that would make these things go together. Not just, it's not just about speed. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, you know, you should try and build this in a weekend, but it's also about accuracy and longevity and just quality of, of parts. If they, for example, sized all their bell cranks to account for powder coat, then I wouldn't be grinding them down and I wouldn't be exposing myself to corrosion. Same thing with the gear legs. If they had sized those, sized those in account, to account for powder coat, I wouldn't be grinding them down and I wouldn't be exposing them to corrosion. Now you can go through and paint everything, but every time you break that powder coat seal, you expose yourself to some corrosion. And it might be minor here and there, but I know it's possible. I, I know for a fact that it is possible to compensate for thickness of paint. I still think there are also some hardware things that could be improved here and there. In general, the marketing for these has shifted to a younger audience that I think is more in tune with the sort of assembly side than the fabrication side. We grew up with Legos and Erector sets and even Lincoln Logs, which go together perfectly. We didn't really, like shops don't really exist in schools anymore. People didn't take machining classes or computer aided dra uh, drafting classes. So people my age and maybe even a little older expect things to fit at a little tighter tolerance just because of the stuff that we were raised around. So I think that for Kit Fox, from a marketing standpoint, they have the marketing. I mean, they definitely have a great brand and image and a, an incredible plane, but they could really put the icing on the cake if they put that little bit of extra effort into, you know, just say, hey, we want you to spend more time in the air than you are diddling around with parts 
So we're making an effort to improve our tolerances so that uh, you're spending less time fabricating and more time assembling so that you're, one, you get a better product in the end, and two, you get um, less time and frustration working on the actual plane. So that's just a little thought. I don't hate this, and I don't hate Kit Fox for that. I have been frustrated, but I've kind of gotten over that. I mean, I get it. It's sort of the industry standard. The only kit that I know of, I've heard from this, this guy who messaged me, um, that is, has good fit and finish and everything comes right out of the box, is the RV series, so the Vans RV aircraft. Everything else you kind of have to fiddle with and get it fabricated right to size. So I think Kit Fox, from a marketing standpoint, if they said and came out and said, hey, we're going to, we're going to make sure that you're going to spend less time fabricating, then they could just wipe everybody out of the water. Uh, I, I wouldn't buy any other kit if they said that. I, st I still would do this again if I had to. I'm, I'm, the issues that you run into aren't, you know, they aren't killers. It's pretty frustrating, but it's not going to say, oh, I'd never buy a kit from Kit Fox ever again. I, I do get frustrated with them occasionally, but I would be a lot less frustrated if they started making the effort to sort of tighten their tolerances down on parts. No criticism to Kit Fox. I'm not an expert. I'm not a machinist. I have talked to a machinist, though, and he said the same thing. I mean, people who fabricate understand how you can fabricate. They understand the tolerances that you can get things to. So when they see this machinist in particular, when he sees you know how some of these parts come out, he kind of gets shocked. He's like, wow, I can't believe that they would send you something like that. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's kind of the industry standard. So anyways, there's my Kit Fox, Kit Fox bashing session is over. I still would buy one. It's not the end of the world. It's just kind of one of those druthers that has driven me nuts in the past, but over it now. So yeah, one month in, pretty much, one month plus, pretty much ready to cover. I'm waiting for parts. A lot of things that I didn't know I needed, like uh, static port is not a standard option. Didn't know that, but I ordered a static port kit. Autopilot uh, mount plates, you can say, oh, why would you put an autopilot in a bush, bush plane? Well, because sometimes not flying is not all, you know, running through canyons and doing loops and flips. There's a lot of legs that are kind of dull and boring and you get beat around with turbulence. So autopilots are, in my opinion, should be, they're, they're so cheap now that they should be standard on planes. I am putting the Garmin autopilot in. So I gotta wait for the mount plates for that. Drill my antenna holes. And yep, that's it. The fuselage can get covered. It's been rigged and I can throw fabric on it. So I, as I said, I'm cra it's crazy that I'm thinking about, you know, I'm just over a month in and I gotta start thinking about, well, shoot, once I cover this, that's maybe two weeks of work and paint, then what's next? I gotta start ordering parts like engines and panels and things like that, so. When I was at the factory actually picking up my kit, I asked John McBean there, I said, hey, can I pre-order one of those G3X panel kits? Just because I know it's gonna take a while for you guys to make them and I could you know, put a deposit down and hopefully by the time I get there, you guys will have them done. Well, John turned around and said, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's gonna be a long time from now and you won't have to worry about it. Well, John, I hate to break it to you, I could do it in two weeks, and if I ordered it today, I wouldn't have it ready. So if I had pre-ordered it, I might maybe have it ready now. So just <laughs> everything went a little bit faster than I may have thought. So pretty exciting. Okay, I just want to thank all the people who are supporting me through this process. Lynn, the machinist, who is just an expert whiz and has really saved me a lot of time. My Uncle Peter, who's really awesome and supportive and you know, try and, tries to talk some sense into me occasionally, uh, and my Aunt Sandy and uh, my dad, my family members who are following along digi diligently and sort of helping me stay excited about this whole project. I've gotten to kind of a lull where it's slowed down, and I have to remind myself what I'm, sort of what I'm in it for, and they kind of give me a little bit of joy uh, every, time, every time I talk to them because there's everybody so interested in seeing what's happened and, and really rooting for me to get it done. So I'm excited and um, I'm excited that people are interested. That, that really excites me and uh, I'm excited to have it done. So thanks for watching and uh, we'll get you another video soon.